my name is Jeff O'Keefe. I know uh, I know a number of you. We've been together many, many times. Uh, I'm the executive director of Zen Peacemakers, and uh, our 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 program today is part of a new series that we're doing called Fearless Hearts. Fearless Hearts, and we're focused on um, women. Uh, in leadership positions in engaged practice, whether that's Buddhism or something else, doesn't have to be Buddhism by any means at all, uh, but engaged practice, social action, but coming from a contemplative standpoint, one way or another. And uh, just to let to let the secret out, uh, uh, the, the secret, my, my, my subversive mission here is 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 really to share creativity, uh, inspiration, uh, ideas, mentorship, uh, stories. Um, you know, ha having our guests share their path. How did they get here? And um, so we'll uh, we'll we'll spend a little bit of time uh, talking here, and at the end we'll have a, an opportunity for questions and answers and uh keep an eye on our calendar if you're if you don't subscribe to the newsletter please do go to the website it's free and you can see what what we're doing we'll 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 have a session like this roughly once a month for 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 a year or so and we may continue it beyond that so i hope to see you join again i'm so happy this time um uh to have two of my favorite people in uh our zen peacemaker community john evans who's a Dharma teacher uh, living in the San Francisco Bay Area, and Christina Jerzykowski lives in Texas. And uh, they are friends. So I think this will be a lot of fun to have them sharing the virtual stage as as, as, as it is. Uh, and uh, we'll have a chance to have them talk about their path and their work and and and, uh, and how how they got how they got where they are these days. So um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, mute myself, and I'm going to pass over to my friend John to, uh, uh, if, if we can have uh, both of you kind of in turn, and flip, please take your time, lean into this, uh, introduce yourself, and, uh, and and share a bit of bio and uh, a bit of background, and then we can get a little more specific. So, John, would you like to take it? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. I. I want to say how really important it's been to have you as the executive director and Zen Peacemakers. It has really blossomed in new ways. We, we are really lucky that you decided to do this. Thank you for bringing all your goodness and your talent. Thank you. Um, how did I get here? Ooh. Uh, Christina and I uh, both wanted to take out the fearless part of that earlier um, announcement, uh, fearless heart. I, I myself cannot say it is, I am fearless. Um, but I can tell you that heart has always been right at the center of why um, spiritual life has become um, so much a major focus of, of my experience in the last uh, now 45 years. <clears throat> um, I was very attracted to that heart as a child, the, the shape of it. And even though I was told often it was so corny, um, <laughs> I didn't care. Um, so maybe that's a, a good, reminder to myself uh, that it uh, it feels like uh, a certain kind of um, insistence on um, what I love has come to be a part of my path. I'm just getting a, sorry, an insistent um, text from um, Dear friends, Peter and Ara, saying they're trying to get in. 
uh, to the waiting room. <clears throat> um, so I'm passing that along. Uh, I chose the um, title or asked to have it changed um, because I love this quote by uh, Don Juan and I'll just read you what it comes from. In beginning a genuine spiritual journey, we have to stay much closer to home, to focus directly on what's right in front of us, to make sure our path is connected with our deepest love. The Yaki shaman Don Juan put it this way to his student, Carlos Castaneda, look at every path closely and deliberately. Try it as many times as you think necessary. And then ask yourself alone one question. Does this path have a heart? If it does, the path is good. If it doesn't, it is of no use. So for me, I said, okay, does this path have heart? That was the beginning. And I don't think, you know, I could have told you that was what I, I saw um, and heard in beginning. Um, and I'm sorry, Jeff. <laughs> I've gotten three now from other people still trying to get in. They get a, an error message that says invalid. Anyway. <clears throat> Thank you. I'll, I'll do what I can. So I started out uh, my my first um, exposure. I've said this before on Zen Peacemaker, so I'll make a very short seeing the photograph of Suzuki Roshi on the back of Zen Mind Beginner's Mind leapt out at me and went directly into my heart. Uh, something about the expression, the, the, the compassion, but also the, uh, the, I thought, look of um, deep grief. He knew something about sorrow and grief that I was um, uh, feeling. Um, in some way, he would understand what I was also feeling. And then uh, a second little teacher uh, I say little because he literally was little. He was a little Japanese Roshi who was about five foot one. I didn't think he was what I thought a Zen teacher should look like. He may not have thought I was like a Zen student. He would look like, I would look like. Um, but I had to drive him around to meet other teachers and Zen centers on the East Coast. We sat next to each other for a week going from place to place. And... Uh, got to know each other quite well. He finally asked me as we were heading home, what was the koan I was working on? And I was very embarrassed and said, well, I'm really terrible at koans. Um, we've been baking for the last several years and we're not really doing koans. And he was silent and I thought, oh, you know, well, he, he knows how, how really, um, pathetic I am uh, and and I then for whatever reason went for it and said but but maybe you could tell me about the last koan because I know I'll never get there and he laughed and said I, I won't tell you the last koan but I will tell you the answer to the last koan I thought oh my gosh you know I'll never get there but I got the last answer okay and he said it's love Wow, I guess that's a teaching for a lifetime. So he was a big part of the encouragement that Zen practice was a path I wanted to take. My years there at Grayston at, at the Zen community of New York um, with Bernie, who we didn't call Bernie, we called Sensei, um, and my Zumi, who we called Roshi, um, were formative years. They were before the real crystallization of Zen peacemakers. 
as a, a way of expressing and practicing Zen. Um, I think they were ideas that Bernie was, was cooking at the time, but it was really Jishu who lit the fire under those ideas. She was my roommate. She was my Jukai mate, my Tokido mate. And together, I think they then were able to do what they were meant to do. And all of you are part of that now. There was not exactly a social justice agenda until pretty far into the bakery when we began to learn with and um, work with homeless people. Uh, mainly it was because we had burned out two entire staffs of Zen students. It was not the reason that we started out that way. Um, and uh, the homeless people were um, not entirely sure that we were very sane. <laughs> they kept saying to us, this is really hard. Why do you do it like this? <laughs> we, we said, because we think this path has heart. Um, we think it's worth paying attention to. So that has fueled me on into a life that has now included a lot of social justice, environmental justice, um, race, gender, um, economic justice. And along the way, I've gotten to meet incredible, beautiful, inspiring activists, one of whom is my friend, Christina Jerzykowski. Um, and we are both very happy to be doing this together. Uh, kind of, um, I want to say, a, a, a moment of um, focus on our own hearts, uh, our own practices that we don't do as much of because we're busy doing things together uh, in the world. So, Christina, would you please introduce yourself more? Thank you, John. Thank you, Jeff. Um, thank you, Zen Peacemakers. Um, that has been a thread in my own life when I was introduced to Bernie because Bernie was looking for someone who was Polish, Catholic, Jewish, and trained in council. And I got the green card. And um, that led to my participation in Poland, which are my roots. My parents escaped Poland the day that Hitler invaded that country. And, and being in Poland in 2001, very shortly after 9-11, um, was a profound experience, not only for the intention um, that was called through Bernie and Andrzej Krajewski, um, but also for me, um, an honoring of my lineage, some known and some revealed over time. And so I acknowledge my ancestry. I also want to acknowledge the many lineages that are represented amongst us and the lands um, from which and in which we tend and learn. And so I want to introduce you to uh, High Hope, um, a, a sanctuary, a place for retreat, and this grand grandmother oak tree um, that blesses us and You'll see some chickens and uh, ducks and maybe some goats um, and a donkey who all participate um, um, 
in our growing relations with the earth and the spirits of the land and the spirits that are both visible and invisible. Um, and when I take a broad scan of the influences, um, there are many. Um, first, I want to acknowledge immigrant mind and a multitude of geographies and languages that have informed me um, in a more natural way about the impeccability of diversity, not only with this earth and with the multitude of realms, but the diversity within um, the human, plant, animal, mineral worlds. And I have to say that has been a great teacher. Um, I grew up partially uh, next to a jungle in Brazil. I then was taken to a cement jungle in France, back to the green jungle, and then to another cement jungle, New York City, which is when I learned English at eight. And those kinds of transitions took me a long, long time to unpack. And I want to name another um, teacher lineage, which we all experience, and that is loss and death. And the heartbreak that follows were, were it to be a loss of a mate, of a parent, of an animal, of a home, of a culture, of a collective consciousness. And so that has led me to um, be extremely curious and curious about different ways so um, in great respect for specificity and um, practice, my inspirations have come from a multitude of teachers and a multitude of practices um, that range from indigenous, Buddhist, cultural, anthropos anthroposophic, the Steiner lineage. And um, I have been heart moved to understand the layers of different teachings that really all say the same, that really encourage and inspire a collective relationship between not only what we know and the understanding that there is so much that we don't know. And I imagine that everyone on this Zoom call and those who will listen after, the bridge to that and in between that is the heart. As Joan read that quote from Don Juan, the path with heart is like the breadcrumb 
the breadcrumb that we can follow out of loss, through loss and grief, through ritual, through ceremony, through practice, to understand what destiny is being called forth from me in this life. And one of the prayers that I have spoken is let me get out of the way <laughs> so that I can be shown the way to fulfill my soul's destiny. And um, that destiny is has taken me to South America and Europe and the middle of the ocean on a sailboat. And to my surprise, even Texas. <laughs> <laughs> and I was brought here through a question that my partner and asked ourselves after we left our current careers for me as a filmmaker in New York City. And we took some time off and we humbled ourselves to the ocean. Grand teacher. And during those first few months, we asked ourselves, many, many questions. At that time, being in our 30s, we had a whole life ahead of us. And we asked ourselves, what can two untrained people do on behalf of nature and wildlife in a hands-on way? And that's where the I don't know comes in, because we had no idea. I've learned that when we ask ourselves a question like that, like the koan and the answer that you were given, Jean, the answer, if we are willing to watch, to pay attention, to follow direction, we're led, we're guided. And I now, almost 40 years later, understand that those kinds of questions are like a boomerang. The boomerang goes out into the universe and eventually returns for us to notice, for us to engage with, for us to practice with. And so, since 1987, I've been taught by these lands, a wildlife preserve for endangered species. And this place I introduced to you earlier, a sanctuary for retreat, a biodynamic farm and ranch, and really a place for individuals and groups to come to relate, to not only connect with nature, to have our world of nature to which we belong, help us understand our own and our purpose. Uh, for this one precious life, as Mary Oliver um, has, has shown us. And um, I'm a student of poetry, and um, I brought a poem from Louise Erdrich, mm -hmm. The Painted Drum, which I would love to read to you. Life will break you. 
nobody can protect you from that. And living alone won't either. For solitude will also break you with its yearning. You have to love. You have to feel. It is the reason you are here on earth. You are here to risk your heart. You are here to risk your heart. You are here to be swallowed up. And when that happens, that you are broken or betrayed or left or hurt or death brushes near, let yourself sit by an apple tree and listen to the apples falling all around you in heaps, wasting their sweetness. Tell yourself you tasted as many as you could. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful, Christina and John. Thank you both so much. I want to just pause for a second. <laughs> Thank you for reading that. Though. Beautiful. <clears throat> one of the one of the uh, things I hope we get from this, um, as I said in the beginning, is uh, encouragement and inspiration for all of the rest of us to uh, trust following our hearts as you as you've described. Um, it's not always easy. Um, it's easy to get lost. And uh, so I wanted to ask you both and, and I don't I don't know if this question will resonate or not, but um, and, and in Zen we have this we have this discussion about sudden sudden or gradual, Let's not go there. That's not what I want to talk about. But um, as you did, a point come for for either or both of you, where you where you looked around and you went, "Aha! This is what I'm supposed to do." And did that come early? Did that come later? Did how did that how, how did that occur? And and perhaps even you know if you. You, if you think about and, and talk about this a little bit, um, did you have doubts about about what you were doing after that? Was there an aha moment where you realized, ah, this is what I'm this is what I'm supposed to be doing? Well, because the spiritual path opened for both of us i would say probably but i'll just say in in some specific ways of um being of service uh, i i can tell you two examples where i knew uh, i knew that um that i was in some way in the place that Christina just talked about in terms of you know what what am I what am I what am I here to do and to offer um, <clears throat> when I sat a retreat with um, Stephen and Andrea Levine uh, Stephen you might remember wrote a book called who dies he was one of the first Buddhist teachers I ever met <clears throat> and um, a friend invited me to go to this retreat and I thought I was just going I, I didn't know what I was doing actually I, I thought I was going to my first non-zen retreat that's what I thought um, and indeed it, it was a, a very unusual um, group uh, and about 80 85 percent of the people in the room were imminently dying 
they were on gurneys, they were on pillows, um, mattresses on the floor. We were in a huge tent and uh, for the next seven days, um, a few of us who came without the sort of understanding of where we were coming, sat there with people who were very ill and people who were taking care of them. Uh, and there was a young man I was sitting next to who was dressed in a ski hat, um, mittens, um, big um, puffy jacket and, and uh, uh, down booties and it was July. So I knew that this person was very ill. He didn't really um, make a move for seven days. He sat next to me uh, just quiet as could be. And we were all trying to be quiet, but there were also lots of sounds that were coming from people. There were moans and cries and uh, occasional uh, screams. And it was, a, it was a very different kind of retreat, uh, but we didn't talk. And, uh, and at the very end, Stephen asked us to think of something that we could offer the person sitting next to us that would be a risk for us. And uh, I, he was the only person sitting next to me. He didn't look at me, but I turned to him and said, would you like a foot massage? And he said, no, and didn't say any more. And I said, well, you know, maybe if I gave you one, you would give me one. And he said, you wouldn't want to give me a foot massage and proceeded to take off his down booty and sock and there were these huge purple lesions on his foot. And he pointed to one of them, the largest one, and he said, that's the first one I ever got. And it was, I'm telling you truthfully, it was shaped just like a heart. Mm -hmm. So I knew that something was here and I was needing to pay attention. It was 1985 and it was the beginning of, we didn't even know what it was called then, but it was the beginning of the AIDS epidemic. And that became the next 12 years of my life was to deal with and be with um, the um, epidemic that was really a revolution in, uh, in all kinds of ways in patient care and relationships between um, institutions like the National Institutes of Health and, and individuals who needed medicine, community, the volunteer communities, the gay community, the straight community, the religious communities. It was, it was huge and that was the path. And then another moment came some years later when I was um, living in New Mexico and was uh, um, bringing um, some, um, how do I say, um, I was bringing some medicines to uh, people on the uh, Navajo reservation that they couldn't get from the Indian Health Service. And, uh, and I met this wonderful woman who was uh, a nurse, but also I believe she was a, a healer in many realms. And she was grateful for the medicines that I was bringing and said to me, I have something to tell you. She said, it's important where you make your fire. Okay, that's, that's something about the next thing. So hearing phrases somehow amplified for whatever reason, um, knowing that where I made my fire, in other words, where was I putting my, my intention? Where was I and who was I making that fire with? And I became very, um, involved with and very lucky to work with indigenous people for the last, I don't know, 28 years of my working life. Uh, and there's much more 
to share there, but I'll just stop. Thank you, John. Christina, does this question resonate for you at all? So I've been sort of scanning, you know, the stories and the arc of life. And, you know, what comes to me is the understanding that I've been guided that even when I have been operating under the illusion that I'm doing the work and I'm being called, there, there is a call that resonates with what I call soul destiny. And the counterpart of that, I have um, named ignorance slash innocence. The innocence of saying yes um, without really knowing what the yes would really demand of me. And especially with the Wildlife Center um, and that whole experience, because consciously I was um, unprepared to return to the United States and be brought to what was for me another foreign country, the state of Texas. Mm -hmm. And yet the universe conspired and events that were challenging and difficult forced us to come. And that experience taught me that if I believe and if I have faith that I am being placed where I can fulfill something greater than my conscious mind can imagine and yet fulfill that in this life, I am taking the steps to fulfill a soul's choice on behalf of a balance with karma, with lifetimes previous and ahead, that all um, uh, the words work and dance together come at the moment that work together and dance together. And there were moments where I was on my knees. There were moments when my face was in the mud with challenges and program and, and problems. And my deep, deep faith for which I'm very, very grateful for would arise me and over time, I felt, you know, however we describe the largest love force in this creative material realm, it was as if spirit was saying, come on, come on, little girl, you got some more. Don't give up. Don't give up. 
you, you got you got a little more to give. Come on. And it was the most and is the most beloved without condition encouragement that comes again through that being and that essence and that presence which we each know as pure heart, pure love. And that presence and essence pulled me up and okay, I can take the next step. And then all of a sudden I was on the way. Um, and that happened multiple, multiple times. Um, you know, now that I'm in my seventies, um, it's a beautiful replay and it's a profound instruction. Um, and I would say to, to this prompt that trust, a trust in something so much larger that I can name and yet visceral in my blood and bones is what has shown me my own impatience. My own impatience is wanting this now. Wanting it to be that way or this way. And over time, I, I mean, I still am. And yet I can lovingly surrender to something so much larger. And maybe this is the time to um, include a quote from Rudolf Steiner that from the first moment um, I saw this in a conference room of RSF Social Finance in San Francisco, and RSF stands for Rudolf Steiner Foundation. Um, so may I read it to you? Please, seek, Christina, please, yes. Uh -huh. Seek the really practical life but seek it in such a way that it does not numb you to the spirit that works within it. Seek the spirit, but not out of spiritual lust or spiritual egoism. Seek it rather because you want to become selfless. Selfless in the practical life of the material world. Apply the ancient principle. Spirit is never without matter. Matter is never without spirit. And say to yourselves, we will do everything material in the light of spirit and we will seek the light of the spirit in such a way that it enkindles warmth in us for our practical deeds. So when I hit the bottom, when I need something to arise in me, that will and determination to meet this material life, I turn to that ancient principle. 
Thank you. Thank you, Christina. <clears throat> uh, I want to ask, and, and Jean, I'll, 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 I'll give you this question because I think Christina really, really touched on this uh, in, in what she just shared. Uh, I think it's easy for a lot of us listening to, to both of you and, you know, perhaps to have to have that notion of, well, it, it, it's easy enough for them because they're accomplished and powerful and fearless. And I, I know you said you're not fearless, but, uh, uh, you know, I couldn't possibly do that um, because of all of these impediments. I wanted to ask you, John, about impediments um, uh, over the years or anything that sticks out in particular, um, because we all have them, don't we? And uh, it, it's never... There's no glide path for any of us doing this kind of work, and 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 there's no there's no blueprint for it either. So, if if that question resonates, any comments about imped, impediments and and uh, and how you face those? Um, well, Christina just said impatience. <laughs> Um, I would say, um, and, and I, I know you're talking about all kinds of impediments, but I'm going to start off with my own. Uh, uh, I think that there is sometimes uh, a recklessness in me and uh, And maybe it's part of the impatience that Christina talked about too. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm wanting something to happen now. Um, unfortunately, that's also usually, um, you know, with myself, um, uh, right there in the smack in the middle. You know, on it now, my way. Um, and and sitting zazen over so many years has really helped with that. Um, to know that uh, I can escape that uh, tyranny sitting on my black cushion and also that um, whatever it is will wait until I get off the cushion. Uh, but I would say that the things that have been impediments which are systemic impediments to are have been a uh, big one has been sexism and uh, the patriarchy uh, I have uh, I have had some um, blocks put in front of me uh, that uh, at times seemed unsurmountable. Uh, and as I have watched the, the world of nonprofit offerings and programs, um, I really have seen that as a, as a tribe, women have uh, incurred that kind of um, difficulty and that so many have um, jumped over whatever obstacle uh, was put there uh, that, that women are doing a huge amount of the heavy lifting um, I'm not saying that there are not great men I, I, I know many of them they're here on the platform um, but it is a, a also a way of diminishing the importance and the leadership uh, somehow to, um, you know, as Sharon Salzberg told me recently about her bringing loving kindness metta meditation forward in uh, Buddhist teachings. Uh, she, and, and I didn't totally realize this until she said it, that um, loving kindness was the first teaching of the Buddha, uh, but that uh, it has been made into some kind of a diminished, um, it's a feminine, uh, a female thing 
uh, in our uh, Zen teachings, um, in our Buddhist world. Um, not not as uh, important, so so to speak, as you know, big enlightenment experiences that uh, have been described. Um, so, um, so that and and uh, and yet, I also feel that um, the feminine, the sacred feminine, has come forward in uh, our whole life in a big way in uh, in my lifetime i'm so so struck uh, you know recently i've been able to start working um, with a dear friend uh, who's here krista uh, and others um, where we're working with um, bees uh, and pollinating uh, and hive uh, as organizing principles and, and actually as as activity uh, in in the world that's not just restricted in a sense to the natural world but also is becoming a way for leaders to come together and communities pollinating each other and uh, sharing the honey and and knowing that there's money that can be made that feels uh, like you know right livelihood and that even in the midst of terrible patriarchy in some of the places uh, where um, we have been working, that um, women are allowed to uh, work with bees uh, and to get themselves out of economic, uh, uh, you know, deprivation uh, to handle money and become uh, involved in commerce, that those are these kinds of you know, impediments that I do see workarounds happening and in my own life as well. Thank you. Thank you, John. <clears throat> um, a couple more thoughts. Uh, I want to leave some time uh, uh, for questions and answers too, but uh, I don't want to be careful about the clock. But um, uh, before everyone came on, uh, the three of us were, were chatting a little bit, and, and we just touched on uh, the notion of, of lineage in our history and and kind of our connection throughout what, whatever it is, our families or our spiritual lineages or our chosen cultural lineages. Um, but it makes me it makes me think about community, and um, I, I want to ask you both about thoughts you might have the importance of or the impact in the work that you've done over the years of allies of allies um kind of starting from the notion that we 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 can't do we can't do this ourselves we can't do this ourselves so uh, maybe, maybe i don't know christina is that uh, something you have a thought about uh yes and is there anything that any of us um think or feel or achieve or produce or imagine that's not along with allies and alliances whether they're in the physical or whether they um, are more in the invisible realm. Um, and, you know, more and more, many of the lineages that we've, we belong to and have named here and beyond are acknowledging the importance of acknowledging those that are invisible, the ancestors. And for example, on these lands that were part a mere 73 million years ago and even farther, this was a sea 
the ocean came all the way up through Texas. And so these lands are laden with sea fossils, be they oysters and clams or big ammonites. And then the history of the first peoples and their tools and their arrowheads that are present here if we so choose to make them present. And if we so choose uh, to open our ears and our eyes to their wisdom in relationship to all time. Because it's, you know, we've been helped by this linear concept of past, present, and future. And again, the lineage of quantum physics has reminded us that time is all time, whether we can conceive it, whether we can embody that, that is actually the space and all time that we move in. Um, and of course, here we are in this circle today at this moment, and yes, these we are all allies. Allies in our listening and allies in our speaking on behalf of something, again, greater than all of us visible at this moment. Um, I have to name the practice of counsel the practices of rites of passage and wilderness quest, the ceremonial and ritual practices within my earliest memories of ceremony in a high mass in a cathedral. You know, that's the first time that incense was introduced to me and how one can, through ritual and ceremony, we can attune to something together that again is so much bigger. Um, I mentioned before the instructions that come through relationships with land, with nature, with the ocean that humbles my human construct and the cultural construct in some traditions that elevate humans above all of life. And so a question for my life is how do I um, bring forth the alliances that it, that exist um, beyond what is in the physical and how do I call in and ask for support and help to the allies, to the traditions, to the circles, to the energy bodies, to the wisdoms of so many wisdom lineages um, that can support, again, uh, the fulfillment of um, that loving kindness to self, to other, to the whole. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. John, uh, thought about allies along the way? Couldn't do it without them. Yeah. <laughs> there have been so many. Uh, I 
seems really one of the important things about how we um, regard allies is to not um, to not make uh, only certain people or only certain um, uh, identities of people um, as your ally. I, I remember learning early on um, when the uh, the Anishinaabe people were uh, were protesting a mine being um, a mine next to a, a very sacred lake. It was Mole Lake, uh, and um, they they were looking for allies. And w what we discovered in our search was that the um, anglers, the fly fishermen, were their allies. They, they had a um, stake in the purity of the water. And uh, it became a very powerful uh, and successful uh, effort to stop the mine which was you know it's it's slurry it's runoff was uh, going into the lake and that and thus into streams where the fly fishermen um, were fishing and it was such a great example i saw it over and over again when we reach outside our usual ideas of who and what we think is uh, the right answer uh, it's always uh, a great possibility that there's a surprise and that there's something better waiting. So there, there's that. Um, and of course, because um, of the, the way in which we understand, uh, as Christina was saying, that our, our, our tribe is not restricted either to just humans, uh, to see allyship uh, in um, water, in um, earth, uh, in fire, uh, and to to know that you know when we we make of something an enemy, or or when we uh, make it other, that uh, ultimately you know that creates great suffering. And I actually I said to Jeff when we were talking before we got on that I have a little poem to read a kind of about this and, and then I think we should also open it to questions and discussion <clears throat> and he encouraged me to read it so it is called we are of a tribe it's by Alberto Rios who is a poet from Arizona uh, we plant seeds in the ground and dreams in the sky hoping that someday the roots of one will meet the upstretched limbs of the other. It has not happened yet. We share the sky, all of us, the whole world. Together, we are a tribe of eyes that look upward, even as we stand on uncertain ground. The earth beneath us moves quiet and wild, its boundaries shifting its muscles wavering. The dream of sky is indifferent to all this, impervious to borders, to fences, to reservations. The sky is our common home, the place we all live. There we are in the world together. The dream of sky requires no passport. The color blue will not be fenced. Blue will not be a crime. Look up, stay a while. Let your breathing slow. Know that you always have a home here. I love that. Yeah, thank you, Alberto Rios. Perhaps we could put the put that title in the chat. If people are interested, to follow up. I, I see a couple of people writing down. So uh, <laughs> we are of a tribe, and I'll write it in the chat. Yeah. 
And we are of a tribe. We are of a tribe. And we are of that tribe, you know, that's, that's our tribe. Uh, that's the tribe that uh, is built on generosity and kind speech and beneficial action. Yeah. Bees, Wonderful. trees, women, men. Thank you. Thank you, John. We have a little bit of time, uh, friends. Um, someone needs to leave. Thank you for staying this long. Have a good rest of your day. But for everyone else, we've got, you know, part of, you know, 20 minutes or so. Anybody have a comment or a question? Um, and you can, uh, you know, uh, I think I can, other than those who have their cameras off, um, I can see everybody. So if you want to just wave your hand. Somebody's just now joining. That's too bad. Um, but if you have a comment or a question, please. Peter, hi. Unless you're just waving hello. Ah, uh, there we are. There you are. Hi, 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 everybody. Um, just uh, you asked that question about allies, and I was thinking yes, yesterday. R and I walked down. We're in New York City. We walked down to Ankyo's Village Zendo to go sit, which. Don't tell anybody, but it's pretty rare for me. <laughs> um, but on the way down, so I, I've i lived on and off here in Manhattan for 50 years. And, and so every, but I haven't been here for a while. So every street corner has a memory and uh, it's pretty strong. And I've, I've heard, we've heard all, heard the expression haunted by memories or haunted by the ghost of memories. And I felt that way walking down uh, until I had basically what your question about allies. And I said, why am I making these memories my my op opposition? Why don't I bring them in and and start calling them blessed? blessed? Maybe blessed is a blessed memory is a better way to, uh, to feel it. Turn, turn them into allies. So anyway, I think we can transform a lot of things in our life from this to that. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Uh, do either of you uh, want to respond to what Peter said, or you don't? We, you don't have to. We can. Peter we can... has been my ally for over. <laughs> no, I don't know how many years. I'm trying to think. It's probably close to fifty. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, but I would say also that you know the the creative uh, spiritual friendships that we have. Um, give us a chance to um, to expand, I guess, some of kind of what Peter's saying too, um, to challenge our ideas uh, with each other, uh, to comfort each other in you know, how little we know at times and how and how uh, how sort of goofy we can be about uh, who's our ally, who's our not our ally. Um, it, it, the world is so filled with helpers and allies and uh, bodhisattvas all dancing, waiting for us to ask them to come be with us. Thanks, John. And if, if everyone uh, uh, wants to look at the chat, uh, Christina also just added uh, the uh, Louisa Erdrich book uh, into the chat. There you go. Anyone else have a comment or a question? We're all friends here. There won't there will not be a quiz at the end of the hour. <laughs> and it's okay if not. I was thinking about not knowing about how we learn the same lessons again and again and again, and we still are not knowing. So this thing that Peter just suggested about um, seeing memories as allies as opposed to something we've lost, it, it brings them both present and um, and sort of moves our mind a little bit so we're bearing witness in in a in a new way in a refreshed way to um yeah 
It was so beautiful to hear both John and Christine speak of their journeys. Mm -hmm. Brilliance in that. Yeah. Thank you, Aura. Thank you, Aura. Anyone else? I, I, I was impressed uh, with the power of story for communication. Um, Jeff and I are working on a project together in, in which we're uh, we're putting pictures together with with writing by various teachers. And we had a thing today where one of the teachers added, he had a kind of a generalization about a certain thing, about parent parenting, I think it was about. Mm -hmm. And he... On, on reflection, he added a particular story about, I don't know, his kid was afraid of the dark and something. Yep. And you can tell it better than I can, Jeff. That's but right. uh, it made, it, 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 to me, it made it, it was fascinating to me how the story il illuminated the generalization and, and, and vice versa. And th that in Christina and John's presentations, I felt that too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the the personal aspect made yeah. the impact orders of magnitude more powerful, didn't it? Yeah. 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 Thanks, Peter. Yeah, the personal gives us a, us other persons a way in because we're persons too, <laughs> you <laughs> know. So we can. This story makes it uh, makes us be able to converse with it in a way that a big just, you know. Amorphous, not amorphous, but yes. concept doesn't have legs. Thanks, Laura. And LM, I don't want to put you on the spot, but you're always good for a good, you're always good for a comment or a question. <laughs> Thank you for putting me on the spot. <laughs> I was resisting. Um, I'm sure I'm sure you'll return the favor one day. So nice <laughs> <laughs> Well, I. Oh, dear. I I want to thank everyone and everything that's been said. Um, what what's stirring in me is, is as I'm on the spot is is um, and it it's kind of a, a mix of everything that's been said and sparked by what Peter said about changing the phrasing, the way of looking at something. And what shifted for me in hearing this is, um, as a child, I was enormously in conflict with my father. Mm. And um, for years, I was angry, blinded by my anger, um, directed by my anger in some ways. And the shift that just happened is, it, ah. Uh, I I was a young man who's grown older and only in the last few months had explained to me why some people are using pronouns like they um, in referring to themselves. I've always thought of he and him for myself. And then in hearing this explanation, they really resonated for me. And for me, the they allows for and makes space for what feels to me a very, very strong feminine side within me, facet of me. And that in some ways was where the real conflict happened with my father. Um, and the phrasing that shifted for me as Peter said that is that my father and I did not know how to love each other openly and face to face mm. and as a father as a son as two human beings um both who were referred to as male and um the reason i came today is is to hear and listen to um i i have lived with an ache that I'm not even able to really say is in my heart. It's more an ache of lack of heart or um, inexperienced heart 
and mm -hmm. um, and my coming to Zen Peacemakers Order, my coming today, is is feeding and nourishing um, a side of myself that has been um, really hungry for for um, blossoming and 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 it strikes too as I listen to people, I think what kept me alive these years, and I'm going to call it feminine, I'm not sure if that really holds is is the creativity, the urge, the hunger, the momentum, the 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 overwhelming, um, amazement I hold for beauty with a capital B. And and the, throughout my life in the various places or phases where I engaged in creative acts, um, that, that has fed me as well as allowed me to serve and be in the presence of others. Um, and and so I, I all of what I'm saying really is thank you. <laughs> thank you. I think thank inexperienced you. heart is the start of a poem. Yeah. It sounds like it. It sounds like it. Um, <clears throat> I'm uh, I, I'm not one for bumper sticker aphorisms, but. Um, Perhaps we could end uh, one of the one of my notes. Uh, uh, a question to ask uh, Christina and and John is, you know, um, assuming that perhaps among among us listening to you today, some of us are timid, some of us are not sure how to start. Um, um, you know, how to move how to move forward. What you know, just briefly in the last few minutes that we have, what advice would you give us? Uh, in terms of, and especially the you know, and not to, not to be selective, but especially the women among the group. Um, what advice would you give us in terms of stepping into this world of engaged social action? Whichever of you would like to answer first. Christina, why don't you go first this time? Yeah, well, I have to reach for something. So, um, uh, mm, uh, be willing to fall, be willing to get up. Um, willing to open one's heart, my heart, your heart. Um, I want to acknowledge that Dina Metzger has um, arrived and she is the source of Jean and I meeting. So she's a lineage and, um, and an ally. And I want to also um, acknowledge her, um, and we have sat in council many, many, many a time, um, the practice of no enemy mind, and to begin in here, and how... I have at times made myself my own enemy. Um, your question, Jeff, um, it brings Rumi into the room. And out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. 
ideas, language, even the phrase, each other, doesn't make any sense. So I'll end by saying it doesn't make any sense. Go with the heart. Ask that question that brought us together with Joan's choice of the Don Juan quote. So thank you, everyone. And thank you, Jeff, for this invitation. And thank you, Joan, for our co-playing and praying together as we do. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. And thank you, Dina. No, I've got to say something. Before. Please, please, Dina. Um, because it, it, this is just such an extraordinary event to listen to the two of you. I have been here. I've just been, you know, masked um, and deeply, deeply moved. But what I want to say is that, you know, there are a lot of quotes and they can speak about who has influenced them, et cetera. But what I know about these two women is that every single moment of their lives, they live this way. And that is so um, moving and startling um, in this uh, world to meet people who I think I think they have no idea how not to live the teachings and and the Dharma that has uh informed them. So I want people to know that. Thank you, Dina. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here too. John, uh, uh might you have some in, in encouraging uh, advice for all of us before we close? Well, I'm wanting to look at Dina for a moment and saying that the importance of doing the practice and of doing the practice of what Dina has taught in so many different ways about entering. She, I remember her saying to me, it's important where the the story begins. It's important how you enter and that you you do the practice and, and you realize as you're doing it. And also that you begin by finding a teacher you have faith in. And that Dina has been a teacher to so many of us who we have been able to have faith in and trust what Peter described about looking at our older fraught memories and uh, turning them over and, and considering them as allies is very much the practice that I learned from Dina mm -hmm. that you called Dina restoration. It's a, it's a restoration and an honoring of something that has been in some way othered and and as Christina said, you know, it is the no enemy way. Um, but I think to have a teacher, to have an ally, uh, is such an important part of what we've been talking about today. And it's not meant to give one's agency over. It is meant uh, to learn to trust and have faith in the relationship that can occur. So it's not exactly advice that I would give. It's, it's just under the category really of um, learning to be in deeper relationship and to restore and, and, and offer uh, a new kind of, um, a new kind of old kind of heart, um, a blessing. Uh, into our lives, you know, to, to know that when we have a teacher, it might be the water, it might be the sky, that, that we're asking for guidance, as Christina has been saying. And at the same time, we're, we're learning to um, 
to to walk ourselves we're, we're learning to um to trust in our own situation our own heart thank you dina mm -hmm. thank you so much yeah thank you for coming too i thought it was you hiding there behind that phone. <laughs> complete honor to be here with you really thrilling to hear you speak tell the stories of who you are the miracle of who the two of you are mm -hmm. and, and my incredible delight that you loved each other in the way that i thought you might when i said well, i think you guys <laughs> Well, we are at the we are at the end of our time, so I want to very, very, very sincerely uh, thank uh, Jean and Christina and our special guest Dina Metzger, who uh, I did not know was hiding hiding in the bushes somewhere. Uh, so uh, welcome and th thanks for being part of our our get together today, and uh, and everyone who attended. And I hope I hope this was valuable for you. And uh, as I mentioned when we began. Keep an eye on our newsletter so you can see what we're doing coming up. This uh, this series, Fearless Hearts, uh, Women in Leadership Positions and Contemplative <clears throat> uh, Social Action, uh, will continue for a year. So uh, uh, keep keep watching what we do.